but first I'm going to talk about something completely different. And this is a uh, picture which is sensual. Um, this is Conway and Fung's topograph. They have a, a, a nice little Paris monograph entitled The Sensual Quadratic Form. And this is the first picture in the first chapter, which is a picture of P1 of Q. So these are all of the elements of Q together with the point infinity. And this is an infinite graph that continues branching as you go out in every direction. Um, and all of the elements of Q show up in here, and it should look familiar. Um, this is arranged in the fairy sequence fashion. Here. So for example, um, between a half and two thirds up there, it's going to branch again. And to figure out what's in that region that's going to appear, um, you add up the numerators and denominators there, and you get, I guess, three fifths. So, um, of course, adding fractions by adding numerators to numerators and denominators to denominators is frowned upon generally. So we should probably put these as vectors. Um, P1 of Q, of course, being all of the uh, um, dimension one uh, um, subspaces of Q squared. And so a vector um, generates the subspace, so this specifies the corresponding subspace. Um, and you can choose the vector so that the, its coordinates <coughs> are integers which are co-prime. And then the only, there's not just one choice, there's two choices if you specify that. So we should really have plus or minus in front of every single one of these vectors. Okay. So these are the points of P1 of Q. And Conway call these, calls these lax vectors to indicate the, the plus or minus is there, even though I haven't um, made the picture busy with all those plus minuses. And of course, you don't have to start uh, drawing this picture with 0, 1, and 1, 0. You can start with any basis of z squared. So let's say u and v to the any basis of z squared. And then you can populate the regions of this topograph with all of the lax vectors as linear combinations of those. Um, and so um, you can both add and subtract them, which isn't necessarily so well defined with the plus or minuses, but as long as there's plus minus over here and plus minus over here, those are the two options. So. Okay, so these are the lax vectors. And why does he want to draw them in this particular way? Um, well, let's look at the, the graph instead of the regions. So um, two lax vectors can form a basis for z squared if together, um, any choice of the signs that you like forms a basis. So that's well defined. So it's sort of a lax basis of z squared. And uh, we started with a, with a basis, uv. So in this picture, every edge is going to represent a basis. And we've labeled the regions in such a way that the basis for a particular edge is just the, the two regions that join that edge. So here u minus v and v will be another basis for z squared. So the edges are bases, and the vertices are super bases. Um, so a super basis is a triple of lax vectors, so that any uh, two of them is a basis. So if I start with some basis like this of lax vectors, there's in fact exactly two ways of forming a super basis. You can add in v. You can add in u plus v, or you can add in u minus v. So <clears throat> the super bases are the vertices. So each vertex is in the center of three regions, and a pair of those regions form a basis, and that's a super basis. Okay, so this is all Conway's terminology in his uh, story. And, um, so, okay. question? Yeah? What's preventing us from adding sort of any invertible linear combination of u and v? To make a, to make a super basis. To what add doesn't work there? Here? Yeah. Well, um, if I add, uh, you mean like u plus 2v, something like that. So what won't be a basis then anymore? Um, u and u plus v. Yeah. yeah. Then you have no way of getting v if you have u and u plus 2v. Uh, yeah, so, good, verifying. These are the only two options. Um, okay, so each super basis contains three bases, and each basis is part of two super bases, and that gives the graph. So the graph is made up of the edges and vertices, and then there's something to check, that you can put this into the plane in such a way that, um, that it breaks up the plane into all of these regions, each one of which is labeled, or can be labeled, with the single common vector which is common to all the things on its boundary. So this vector v is part of this basis, this super basis, and so on and so forth. Okay. 
Okay? And you can make this picture. This is all um, in that wonderful little book, which I highly recommend. So this is a picture of P1 of Q, or if you like, you can think of it as a picture of P1 of Z. Um, you know, if you think of P1 of Z as a scheme over spec Z, then being a basis means two distinct points, and being a super basis means three distinct points. But we're going to use Conway's terminology, lax vectors in Z squared. Okay, so the questions about the topograph here. So this book was called The Sensual Quadratic Form, and he was interested in this because he wanted to study binary quadratic forms on Z squared. So integral binary quadratic forms, and quadratic forms, of course, satisfy the parallelogram law, which, now that we have this nice picture, you can see as a relationship between the values of the form evaluated <coughs> at these lax vectors. Remember, the quadratic form doesn't care about plus minus. Um, for the four regions which surround any one edge in this picture. So you can just um, apply the quadratic form to all of these different regions and get values out. And if you start with three, which surround a super basis vertex, then the parallelogram law allows you, using this, the information surrounding this edge, to figure out this value of the form. Um, so you can sort of travel along, filling out all the other values of your quadratic form. And this tree is a single connected tree that has as its regions all of P1 and Q. So you get all of the values of your quadratic form, your integral quadratic form, this way. And, um, and Conway called it a topograph because these, you're supposed to think of these as height above sea level. And so this is some sort of topographical terrain. And he talks about rivers and lakes and valleys and, um, and wells and things like this. And he gives a nice visual classification of um, quadratic forms into you know, indefinite, positive, definite, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a nice, this is just the first chapter, this is quite a, nice, uh, quite a nice thing. And I always sort of had a soft spot for this in my heart after um, when I first saw it as a graduate student. OK. So now I'm going to completely switch topics to have and circle packings. So there's an Apollonian circle packing. And um, the fundamental object here is a Descartes quadruple. So these are just circles in the plane. And if you have any four which are pairwise mutually tangent um, with disjoint interiors, then we call it a Descartes quadruple. So our circles are oriented. And this circle out here is oriented oppositely from these ones here. So these ones have their interiors here, here, and here. And the interior of the circle on the outside is all this stuff. So they're disjoint interiors. And the one fundamental fact that you need to know about uh, such circles is that if you start with three solid ones here, for example, three mutually tangent circles, um, tangent to disjoint points, not, all, not something to generate. Right? Then there's exactly two ways to choose a fourth to make a Descartes quadruple. So you can put back this one to make the one we just saw, um, but the other choices in here would be tangent to all three. So I, uh, I had, um, learned anything about Apollonian circle packings when, when a friend of mine, Lionel Levine, who works in um, probability and combinatorics, called me up and said, uh, we're getting Apollonian circle packings and something that I'm doing. Do you know anything about these? Because I guess I'm his number theorist on this uh, phone. And so uh, I said no. But it turned out that Elena Fuchs was giving a talk at Stanford at the time. And so I learned about Apollonian circle packings from her. And the reason they're of interest to number theorists, um, Oh, sorry, I should have been launching into that story after telling you what the packing actually is. All I did was tell you what the quadruples were. Uh, start with three of these, okay? And then for every triple that you see, there's two ways of adding a fourth one, so just add those in. And now you've got more triples. For example, now we have a triple with this guy, this guy, and the big one. And we can complete that to a quadruple by adding a circle in here. And so you just keep adding in all the ones that you can possibly add in to make quadruples. And you continue at infinity, and that's how you get a beautiful circle pattern. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, um, yeah. So he uh, he called me up, um, asking about uh, if the the number theory is such things. And the number theory comes from the study of well, there's just a few other examples. Um, this one has curvature zero here. Straight lines count as circles. That one continues up and down forever. Um, the number theory comes from the curvatures in the Apollonian circle packing. So the curvature is just the inverse radii. Um, and if you have a Descartes quadruple, the curvature is A, B, C, and D satisfy the symbol relationship which Descartes noticed. And uh, I think this is the, the citation for this, the first time this equation occurs, is in a letter to Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Um, anyway, so if you have three curvatures, say A, B, and C, that are fixed, those are your triple you're starting with, then there's two ways of adding um, a fourth curvature to get a Descartes quadruple. So if we call those D and D prime, 
they're the solutions to this quadratic equation d here. And so um, you can just look at the trace to determine that their sum has to be twice the uh, sum of the original three curvatures. So the first of these we usually call the quadratic Descartes relation, and the second one's like the linear Descartes relation. And so what happens is that if you've got a uh, circle pack in which the first four circles you started with um, are integers, then when you go to look for this other solution, in prime it's also an integer, and so on and so forth. And so the entire um, Apollonian circle packing is made up of circles of integer curvature. So here's an example of curvatures are labeled. And the one on the outside is curvature minus six because its orientation is opposite. We're next. Okay. So right now, now I'm in a room full of number theorists and they're all looking at this picture and they're all dying to know what are these integers, right? Um, and so there's been a lot of um, study of this collection of integers and what integers occur. And particularly recently, there's been um, some interesting work done. There's a series of papers by Graham, Ligarius, and Alice with Sinan in which they uh, formulate a strong density conjecture. So this is that, um, so first of all, there's some congruence conditions you can get your hands on, mod 24, um, which exclude certain congruence classes for the values of the curvatures in a given time. And the conjecture is that, aside from those congruence restrictions, um, all sufficiently large integers are going to appear in the packing. We have so many of these tiny little circles in there that we eventually get everything. And, uh, and so there's some of the recent uh, progress on that. Um, Sarnak proved uh, that yes. infinite in many tangent circles of prime curvature, which he called twin primes, I guess, so we could say he proved like a prime conjecture. Um, and we're getting shows that there's a positive proportion of primes amongst the, the integers. So now I told you two stories. And when I saw Elena's talk, and first one to basics here, um, I couldn't help but notice this coincidence that um, just started bothering me. So on the one hand, you have the Descartes rule, which says that from three circles, there's two ways of adding a fourth to make a quadruple. And their curvatures of the two new ones add up to twice the sum of the previous curvatures. And in Conway's homograph, you have two distinct points, two points forming a basis. Um, and there's two ways of adding a third to make a triple in such a way that the values of the quadratic form on the two new things you plug in, uh, those are the two new things you can add in to make your triple here, is equal to twice the sum of the previous values. So is this a coincidence? And the rest of the talk is basically um, an attempt to say, no, this is not a coincidence. Um, there's something very interesting about that. Okay. So let's go back to Conway's topograph. Um, in this analogy on the last slide, it's the vectors which were uh, sort of analogous to the circles. Right? So they're, they're what I want to concentrate on. And so let's make those the vertices. And then let's connect two, um, two vertices whenever together those two lax vectors form bases. So then the, you get this graph. is actually an infinite graph. I'm going to show one tiny piece of it. Made up of all of these triangles, each triangle representing a super basis. So I'll call this Conway's palace just to keep it separate from Conway's topograph. Now let's do the same thing with the circle packing. Um, so a graph like this is called an Apollonian graph. People have already drawn this picture before. Um, put a vertex at the center of each, uh, at each circle and draw a line if they are tangent to one another. And if you actually draw it in the plane on top of the packing, then you get it going right through the, the point of tangency. But I'm just considering this graph. And then you'll see that I've made a, a, in darker lines there, I've made a tetrahedron. And Descartes quadruple is going to give you a tetrahedron, a complete graph on four vertices, since every circle is tangent to every other one. So this is a graph made out of tetrahedra um, that looks a little something like Conway, so it's a starting point. And then, um, this isn't, so this is sort of in retrospect, um, but, uh, but I finally realized that um, that the correct way to look at this is to put these circle packings into P1 of C, put them in the complex plane, or the extended complex plane. So we have Mobius transformations, the automorphisms of the extended complex plane, and PGL to C, if you think of matrices acting on the vectors. we are thinking of P1 of C as lax vectors again, except now you can think of, well, we'll get to that in a second. The lax, the word lax, we'll get to in a second. Um, and of course, you can look at, since we're number theorists, the Q of I points in there. And I'm 
going to be interested in PGL2 of Z adjoint I, which is going to take rational points to rational points. So it acts on Q of I, P1 of Q of I. And uh, oriented circles are taken to oriented circles. You have to include lines as circles, of course. Lines are circles through infinity. And I'll call something a Gaussian circle if it's an image of the real line under one of these transformations in PGL to Z adjoint I. Okay, Gaussian for Gaussian integers. Okay. And so here, this, <coughs> which I won't tell you where I get it from to begin with, this group here of, this is a subgroup of PGL2 Z adjoint I. And if you look at the images of that group under, the, of the real line under that group, you get the strip packing on its side now in the plane. And if you apply some other transformation afterwards, since circles and tangencies are taken to circles and tangencies, we get another Apollonian circle packing. And this one actually fits right here. Its outer circle is the same as this circle, but oriented the other way. Um, <clears throat> and you can get lots more um, by taking on cosets of this group. Okay, so let's zoom in on a little piece of the strip packing there, the one on the left in the last slide. And uh, I, think, I think maybe it doesn't show up super well on the slide, but the circles are drawn. Can you see the circles a little bit? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I've drawn an Apollonian palace on top. Okay. So these are the centers of the different circles. This one's off the slide a little bit. And each edge of this Apollonian palace, the graph on the Apollonian strip packing, which I called an Apollonian palace, um, each edge of that goes through one of the tangency points, and I've just marked what that tangency point is. Now, these are points inside P1 of C, so I really want to think of them as vectors. Um, I can put this vector in lowest form and think of it as a vector. Uh, sorry, I can put this uh, Gaussian, uh, this Q adjoint I point in lowest form as a fraction. Think of it as an element of Z adjoint I squared, just like we did at the very beginning of the talk with Q1 of Q. Um, and if we do that, then we've labeled each of these edges with a lax vector. Or if you like, just think of it as labeling with elements of P1 of Q adjoint I. Okay, just keep that picture in mind. Now, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna switch to talking about Z adjoint I instead of Z squared for Conway's story. So bases and super bases are the same, but the word lax, when we talk about lax vector, means multiplication by any unit because um, because if you're choosing your points to be coprime and z to join i, um, you can still multiply by, by any unit. So now, if we have a super basis, which is a triple, just like before, a triple of three lax vectors, and two of which form a basis, then we're going to draw them um, as labeling the edges of a graph on three vertices. Okay. So whenever I have a super basis, I'm going to think of it as such a thing like that. And then I'm going to define an ultra basis. Um, this is a tetrahedron of edges, so there's six edges here. Uh, so it's, it's six vectors such that particular collections of size three are superbases. And the easiest way to explain which collections is to draw it as a tetrahedron and say each face is a superbasis. So that's what an ultra basis is. And then the observation is that that picture of the Apollonian palace on top of the strip packing that I drew two slides ago, if you use those, um, those tangency points as lax vector labels, then the triangles are all superbases and the tetrahedra are all ultrabasis chambers. So I call the superbases walls and the ultrabases chambers just because it's a little easier on the, on the mouth. So. Um, so here's an example illustrating that. So if we take just, we zoom up on one little piece of that picture, then you've got a triangle in here and you take those three, uh, those three points, um, write them in lowest form here so we get lax vectors, and these three form a super basis. Um, so any, you put two of these together, um, they form a basis. And as a consequence of that, they have to add up with some unit multiples to zero. So I'm just verifying that on the slide. So that's the observation, is that um, that, that looks like uh, we've got super bases and ultra bases going on. Okay, so in order to show that this is actually happening, what I'm going to do is define um, something called the Apollonian city, which is a graph that I'm going to define just in terms of P1 and Q adjoint I, just in terms of bases and ultra bases and super bases. <coughs> and then I'm going to show that it's exactly the same thing as the Apollonian palace that we get from a super packing. So 
the only observation you really need to make is the equivalent to this observation in order to define this thing, which is that if you have one super basis wall, say U, V, W here, um, then there's only two possible ultra bases that contain that wall. Just like for any basis, there's only two possible super bases. So this is just um, an exercise in you know, checking things. Here in this picture, what I've done is I've called U, V, and W. I've chosen their signs in such a way that they're, um, they add up to zero uh, without any unit multiples or anything like that. And then this is well defined once you make that convention. So these are the only two possibilities. So that means that what you can do is you can start with the complete collection of ultra basis chambers, all these complete graphs on four vertices, and you can glue them to one another by sticking them together whenever they share a face, and just sticking the face together by you know, connecting the labels to the labels appropriately. So taking these two guys, holding them in, and like that. Um, and so since each, um, uh, since each wall appears only on two different chambers, what you get is that when you glue these all together, um, each wall exists between two chambers. You get, uh, you get what I call the Apollonian city. It's the name of this, this graph that you've just formed by this definition. Okay, so once we define the Apollonian city, the main theorem is that this is actually the palaces that you get from the circle packings. And in fact, what happens is the Apollonian city is not connected. It consists of infinitely many components, and each of them is a palace coming from some Apollonian circle packing that you've put into the extended complex plane. So the components of the Apollonian city are exactly the Apollonian palaces corresponding to all the Gaussian Apollonian circle packings, meaning made of Gaussian circles um, in the same city. And the resulting map from the vertices of the city to um, Gaussian oriented circles is a bijection. So this is so studying the Apollonian city is actually studying the collection of Gaussian circles. And it's also studying the collection of Apollonian circle packings because um, in some sense I'll explain in just a second, all of the Apollonian circle packings appear. So if you have um, an Apollonian circle packing and all of its curvatures are co-prime, you call it primitive. There's no common factor. And strongly integral, the definition of that is that when you put it, it we're talking about um, packing before you put it to, to C infinity. You put it in in such a way that if you multiply the center times the curvature, you get a Gaussian integer. This was already, uh, I mean, I, I'm not making this definition. Um, and so then it turns out that all primitive, strongly integral Apollonian circle packings are made up of Gaussian integers and they give some palace inside the Apollonian city. So everything is there. Um, up to rigid motions. <clears throat> so if we're really studying the collection of Gaussian circles, then what do they look like? Well, they're dense in the plane, so if you draw all of them, you won't get a very interesting picture. But if you draw just the ones of bounded curvature, so this picture is curvature bounded by, say, 40 or something like that, I think, then you can see that there's this wonderful intricate relationship between all of these different Circles. So, for example, you can see some of the packings in here. This one, this big arc here, together with these two arcs, and this circle here, form um, an Apollonian, uh, uh, sorry, a Descartes quadruple. That wasn't my computer beeping, was it? No, it was a computer, my computer. <laughs> I believe I'm not running the battery. So, in this picture, then, um, all the red circles um, are either tangent or disjoint. And same for the blue. The blue picture is actually the red picture rotated by 90 degrees. If you look at it that. And what's happening is the red picture is actually all the images of the real line under PSL2 Z adjoint I considered as a rank 2 subgroup, or sorry, index 2 subgroup inside PGL2. Um, and the blue is its non trivial coset. And so these are all the Apollonian circle packings all, all put together. And this picture, um, I'm not the first person to draw this picture, um, but I'm the first person, as far as I know, to draw this picture from that definition. Um, it's uh, the, the series of papers that I mentioned earlier by Graham, Ligarius, Malos, Wilkes, and Jan. Um, they also draw this picture in one of their papers, but they, um, they define it differently. And I don't, I don't think that they realize it's the same as this picture. So anyway, so this is, this is what we're really um, studying with the Apollonians. 
So here's sort of a restatement of the main uh, theorem is that we have this graph that we can define in terms of P1 and Q of I um, by moving these ultra basis chambers, and then it has um, meaning in terms of circle packings. And so the vertices are the circles, and then edges are lax vectors are tangencies, and so on and so forth. But if the circles here are what's important, then we'd really like to know um, what does it mean in terms of P1 of uh, Q of I um, to be a vertex in the optimal city. And in order to prove the theorem, what you have to do is fill in that question mark and show that it makes sense from both sides and it's the same. <coughs> so what is that? So what I'm going to put there is a lax vertex lattice. So to motivate the definition, let's start from the circle side where it makes a little bit more sense. If you start with the Gaussian circle, you can think of that circle is associated to the transformation which maps the real line to that circle. So let's look at that transformation. Um, then think about, we're, we're interested, as nobody there is, I suppose, in the Q of I points. And so think of the image of Q, that maps to all the Q of I points under this transformation. And if you think of it in terms of vectors, that means you're taking a copy of Z squared, or at least the primitive vectors in Z squared, you're applying this matrix to it, and you're getting out um, the, the vectors which correspond to these points, and they look like this. It's another, uh, it's another Z module of rank two. It's made from the column vectors. So we're just interpreting this in terms of the lax vectors. And, um, and of course, M, this is PGL, so we can scale M, so we have to think of different um, scalings of this lattice as being the same thing. And, but we've decided that we want A, B, C, and D with the elements of Z to join I, so we really only have L and I, L as two different Sorry, two different lattices in the same equivalence class. And I won't go into the details, but you should consider orientation of the circles, so you should really think of these as oriented lattices. Um, okay, and now there might be many different uh, transformations that take R to that circle, but they'll all be related by um, precomposing by some element of PSL2 Z, which means change of basis. So the lattice is well defined, even though the basis that I give here isn't. The orientation is still well defined as well. So that's that's the, the thing. It's a lax vertex lattice. It's an oriented rank to Z submodule of Z to join I squared, generated by an oriented Z to join I basis, or Z to join I squared, if you like. But that's the closest um, I can get to saying what it is in terms of the lax vectors in analogy to, to and so um, what you want to do is define it for the Apollonian city instead of for circles, and then show that it's, it's the same thing. So for the Apollonian city, you can just look at those standard ultra bases that I gave a few slides ago where were they, these guys. Um, any chamber can be drawn this way by some appropriate choice of what U, V, and W mean. And then you just tack on those particular, these are um, bases giving the lattice. Um, so you can just define it like that without motivation on the Apollonian and city side. And then you discover that, uh, <coughs> ignoring the orientation for a second, the lax vertex lattice of this vertex is actually the unique one which contains all of the lax vectors that are adjacent to it here. So this, in the, in the complete graph that you end up with, the whole thing, this is infinite valence right here. And it has all of the primitive vectors inside this lattice shown on all of those adjacent edges. All right, so now we want to answer the original question, um, or at least the other part of the original question, which was uh, if Conway drew this picture in order to study values, values of quadratic forms, then, um, then what, what's the analogy here that gives us the curvatures? Because it was the curvatures that had the same linear sort of relation as the parallelogram of one gave. And the answer is to replace a quadratic form with a Hermitian form. This is just the definition of a Hermitian form, which you know. But I'm actually interested in the imaginary part of a Hermitian form. And it has this important property, which is that if you apply a transformation to the two inputs um, with coefficients in the reals, then it transforms by the determinant of that transformation. And in particular, um, if you've chosen the determinant to be one, then it's still exactly the same. So that means that you can actually apply this capital H to a lattice a lax vertex lattice because if you change basis, it doesn't change the value of the Hermitian form. 
So you can evaluate the permission form at a vertex in the outline to see. So here's the two um, standard chambers, like this, this is standard sort of things, which are attached, sharing one side. And uh, if you evaluate H on all of these corners and you just use some properties of permission forms, you get this relationship. Okay, this looks kind of nasty, so let's draw it a little more simply. Let's just call those values A, B, and C on the vertices which are in common, and D and D prime for the two um, extra vertices, one for each chamber. And this is the relationship. So the, the values of the form on the two new vertices add up to twice the sum on the common vertices that you already had between these two chambers. So this is the, um, the linear Descartes rule that we were looking for. And so the hope is that um, this Hermitian form is taking values uh, which are the curvatures. But what Hermitian form? Well, if you choose just the right one, you do in fact get the curvatures, even though that's true in more generality for the imaginary card bending Hermitian form. But if you pick that one, and then you take a look at the four corners of some chamber, then they satisfy the full Descartes rule. And these actually do give the curvatures of the corresponding circle when you look under the bijection. So this answers the why are these two things sort of the same. Um, so I was going to add uh, just a few more uh, sort of appendices, um, interesting things that you get out of this. Um, but maybe before I do that, I'll mention that, um, uh, that my friend Lionel called me up and, and made me think about up on certain lines in the first place. So he was interested in this question um, because he's studying abelian sand piles. <coughs> and uh, um, David Wilson at Microsoft Research um, sent me some data, which was just a picture of um, part of the Appalachian strip packing, where you could mouse over the different parts of the picture. And each circle that you mouse over, it would show you a lattice. Not a lattice in Z join I squared, but just a lattice in Z squared. And that lattice had determinant equal to the curvature of the circle. And, uh, but he didn't have any particular basis for it or anything like that. It was just an arbitrary basis for all of these things. Um, and it's that that let me figure this out. So I've now inverted the story, but the story came from that question. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that relationship. So, so here's some of the different permission forms that you could pick. The first one gives the curvature, so you have to multiply by two, you know that. And, um, and the second ones, if you put them together, give the product of the center times the curvature, which, which was already known to be um, of interest for Appalachian circle packings, because that's the definition of strongly integral, so that's a Gaussian integer. Um, but so here you can see that it's going to satisfy something like the linear Descartes rule as well. Um, OK, so. If, let's just look at the curvatures. Now, this Hermitian form, these are the two column vectors there, the two vectors you're sticking in this column. It's the second coordinates here that feed into the, this Hermitian form. So we might as well just drop that extra information, the alpha and the gamma, and just look at the beta and the delta. Those are elements of Z and join I, but let's think of them just as coordinates. A plus B I is just the coordinates A, B, and Z squared. So we'll leave Z and join I as Z squared, and then those two um, elements are like uh, um, elements of z squared, which um, generate some z, z sublattice. Um, and again, because of the, the same reason that the lax vertex lattice is, you really want to consider an equivalence class of two things. Okay, and then this lattice there, which is now a lattice inside z squared, um, its determinant is negative the curvature of the circle. So these are the lattices that I saw in um, David Wilson's data. And here's an example uh, of the circles labeled with such things. So this guy, the determinant is minus 2, so it has curvature 2. <clears throat> and then you get um, this relationship. From the structure that we have, you can now write down, for any three circles, you can write down lattices associated to them. And then you can write down this rule, which says whenever you have a triple and you put it in this form, here's the two new lattices that you can add in as you complete your triple two Descartes quadruple in the two possible ways. And uh, the way that, um, that I ended up uh, finding this answer to that original coincidence question is by noticing this pattern in David Wilson's data. So this is um, just mousing over and looking at these things. If 
finally realizing that when you look at two that are next to each other, they have some vector in common that's been rotated by 90 degrees, which hints at the Gaussian images. And so as a final, um, a final note, you actually get a quadratic form from each of the lattices in each of the circles. So it's actually, um, uh, the fact that there's a quadratic form associated to each circle is something uh, that's also, that will, that's actually really important in some of those big results that I cited earlier, which is, so the statement is that for any circle in the packing, if you look at the curvatures that are of the circle's tangent to it, so all the curvatures surrounding it, they're actually the values of a quadratic form, except that they're translated by the curvature of that one fixed circle. So that was important in figuring out what the values of the, uh, what integers show up in the packing. Um, but now you can actually see the quadratic form um, as being related to this uh, circle lattice that I called it on the last slide. So if you want to know what the quadratic form is, you just take your lattice um, uh, regnet, regnet's basis as column vectors, and then you get this guy. So it's really just, if you decipher this, it's um, the form x squared plus y squared evaluated on that particular circle lattice, so all its values on that. And so it has discriminant negative 4 times that determinant, which is the curvature. So now you have essentially like a, a Descartes rule for all of the different um, quadratic forms that show up in the packing. Um, and so I think that's the, the part of, that's new of what's on the slide here. Um, yeah, so here we have black circle lattices are in correspondence with equivalence classes of primitive positive definite integral binary quadratic forms of discrete negative four times the square. So I'll get rid of saying that. Um, so, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so those are the extra. Uh, bonus parts of the talk, so I'm done. Yep. Thank you. Questions for Katha? Have you shown this to Conway? I emailed him, he never opened. Storm his office. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again.